Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ben Carson. Thank you. I am absolutely delighted to be here uh, once again. And it seems like uh, each time I'm here, we're getting closer to critical time periods in our country. You know, I started to talk about all the failures of the uh, current administration, but I figured that was too depressing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's so depressing. I think that's why they always try to rename everything and uh, redefine everything, and it's probably why they're ready for Hillary, too. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting to me how the left in particular loves to relabel and name things. You know, for instance, if you're pro-life, then you're anti-woman. If you're pro-traditional family, then you're a homophobe. If you're white and you oppose a progressive black person, you're a racist. If you're black and you oppose a progressive agenda, you're crazy. And if you're black and you oppose the progressive agenda and you're pro-life and you're pro-family, they don't even know what to call you. I mean, you end up on some kind of watch list for extremists. <laughs> Unbelievable. But you know what? We're not going to pay attention to that. What we do have to pay attention to is how do we use the incredible brains that God gave us to recognize when things don't work and to recognize when things do work and to fix problems. For instance, you think about there's a large number of people in our country who are the downtrodden. And how do we treat them? Well, you know, starting in the 60s with the Great Society programs, we figured if we just threw money at the problem and we had all these welfare pro uh, programs that we could solve the problems. What has happened since then? In 1969, 1.4% of our population was on food stamps. Today, more than 14% are on food stamps, a tenfold increase. We have uh, more broken families, out of wedlock births, uh, incarceration, crime. Everything that these programs were supposed to fix has gotten worse. So what do people do about that? Intelligent people would look at that and they would say, we need to change course. People who, people who perhaps fail to utilize their intellectual capability would look at that and say, we need to do it more. We didn't do enough. And you know, that's the difference. But we need to move in a very different direction. We need to understand what true compassion is in order to reach out to individuals who think that maybe being dependent is reasonable as, as long as they feel safe, and it isn't. It really is not compassionate to pat people on the head and say, there, there, you poor little thing, I'm gonna take care of all your needs, your health care, and your food, and your housing. Uh, don't you worry about anything, because it's all those bad people who's causing your problem, and I'm gonna fix it. That's not compassion. That's the opposite of compassion. That is making people dependent. What real compassion is, is using our intellect to find ways to allow those people to climb out of dependency and realize the American dream. And that's what we need to be thinking about. It's about investing in our fellow human beings, just like Muhammad Eunice, who won a Nobel Prize in 2006 with his program of micro-lending, lifted millions of people out of poverty 
in Bangladesh and that area of the world. And, you know, we are very smart people and we're very compassionate people. And we need to find out how do we strengthen the fabric of this country. And it is our responsibility to take care of the indigent. It is not the government's responsibility. I understand that. Now, some people say, well, it doesn't sound very compassionate. It is compassionate. I was in the airport a couple of months ago, and a lady came and sat down next to me, an African-American lady, and she said, I really like what you have to say. It makes so much sense. But why don't you want poor people to have health care? Now, I say, you've been listening to the propaganda. That's all it is, propaganda. I want everybody to have good health care. We spend twice as much per capita as the next closest nation. And we still have terrible access problems, inefficiency, expense. And we can do so much better. And that's why I've advocated a system. And I hope Congress will listen very carefully to what I'm about to say, because they need to grasp a health care alternative before they try to remove Obamacare, if they really want to get some traction. And uh, what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is health savings account system. They work extremely well, available for everybody. We don't force people into them, but I tell you, when people see how these work, you won't have to force them into it. And uh, there are a variety of different ways to pay for it. But even the indigent, and that's what I want to talk about because she said, I don't care about poor people. If we can fund the indigent. How? We spend $400 billion a year according to uh, the Heritage Foundation, on Medicaid, $400 billion a year. A quarter of our people are involved with Medicaid. That's 80 million people. Divide 80 million into $400 billion, $5,000. $5,000 each. Now, boutique practices, concierge practices, on average, cost two to $3,000 a year. So you could put everybody uh, in a boutique practice and have thousands of dollars left over for catastrophic health care. That's how wasteful we are. That's how wasteful we are. Now, we don't have to use that much money, but I'm just giving you an example of what we're doing and even asking for more. It really isn't the affordable health care. It's not affordable, and it is absolutely about redistribution and control. And uh, if we really want to use our intellect, we will come up with something that really works for everybody. It makes a big difference. But what are the things that are going to destroy us as a nation? Our debt, 18.1 trillion and rising. We need to get out of the mindset that says, because the debt didn't go up as fast in this quarter, it's a victory. The debt needs to be going down. The size of government needs to be going down. We need to be able to deal with that in a logical way. The, the, other thing, the other thing that threatens to destroy us, radical Islamic terrorists all over the world. And, and let's not get distracted by just ISIS. We need to recognize that the Shia in Iran are every bit as dangerous, perhaps even more dangerous. We could take our eye off the ball as they develop nuclear weapons. We also need to recognize that we have friends over there. Let's not turn our back on Israel. Let's listen to Netanyahu and what he has to say. But, you know, I, I have so many things to talk about and only 12 minutes to do it. And now I'm down to just three or four. But, you know, what am I for? What am I really ready for? I'm not ready for Hillary, but what am I ready for? I'm ready for a country that puts our Constitution on the top shelf, every part of it. And, and for those who have any doubt, that includes the Second Amendment. Now, the, I'm for a country where we take the restraints off the most dynamic economy the world has ever known. Let that economic engine work for us. I'm for a country where we develop our natural energy resources. We have been blessed with them. Let's not make that a curse. That's a wonderful thing. 
And it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that we can't also look for alternatives and, and take care of the environment. Some people think it's one or the other. It's not one or the other. That's why God gave us these fancy brains, so we can do more than one thing at one time. You know? I'm, for a, I'm ready for leadership on the world stage, not just sitting around and waiting to see what other people do. I'm for, I'm ready for school choice. You know, we need to recognize education is the great liberator in our country. No one has to be a victim. I'm for putting our health care in our hands and not in the hands of some bureaucrat. And, and for balancing our budget and for a fair taxation system that allows us to get rid of the IRS. And, and, and for a strong military. Wasn't it wonderful seeing those cadets from the Citadel? And, and for taking care of our veterans the way they should be taken care of. And for honesty and integrity and common sense and courage, because courage is what we really need. We don't, we, we shouldn't submit to the PC police and to people who are trying to control us by intimidation and by IRS audits and by messing with your job. You know, the only reason they can do that is because we sit silently by. That's what they want us to do. We have to stop sitting silently by and express ourselves. You know, like in the pre-revolutionary days, our ancestors, they got together, they talked about what kind of country did they want, what were they willing to fight for, and they did fight for it. We have to be willing to fight for it. The baton is now in our hands. We need to talk to our uncle who hasn't voted in 20 years. Go to your grandmother who's an inv invalid and uh, make sure she has an absentee ballot. Help her fill it out. The baton is ours. Freedom is not free. It must be fought for. And remember, we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, but you can not be free if you're not brave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I think, uh, I think we're going to have, for the first time at CPAC, we're going to have a little Q&A. So yes. where's the Q? There's I'm, the Q. I'm here, Dr. Carson. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Um, please behave for me. This is okay. my first time doing this. Um, we are actually have conservatives all across the country via Twitter sending uh, questions for you to answer. And as you all know, it's, it's a different format this year, so anyone that the media perceives as a presidential candidate will be subjected to these same questions and answers. No problem. So, great. So let's start with the first question. And um, the question is, what is your specific plan for national security and managing the threat against ISIS? Okay. Well, the key thing is concepts. You have to recognize that if I decide to run and if I were in the office of president, um, you have to say those things. Uh, I, I would recognize that there is a role for the Commander-in-Chief and his staff, and that is to define the mission. What is the mission? The mission is recognizing that we have radical Islamic terrorist groups that are in their adolescent stage that wish to destroy us. And we have two choices. We can wait and see what they're going to do and react to it, or we can destroy them first. And what I would... I, the mission that I would give our military is to destroy them first, and I wouldn't tie their hands and let them get it done. Are you ready for the second I, question? Ready. Okay, that was good. Um, the second question is, how do you plan to restore Amer the American dream and make us feel more united and less um, divided? Well, first of all, I think the bully pulpit and the position 
of the presidency is very, very important because it sets the tone. And, you know, we have a nation now where we have people in our highest levels who exacerbate the division. You know, they've created a war on women, race wars, income wars, age wars, religious wars, you name it, there's a war on it. The real enemies in our country are the people who are the purveyors of division, no matter where they are. And I think, I think we have to call them out on that and recognize when we say a nation with liberty and justice for all, all means all. That means everybody. It means we don't pick and choose the laws that we want to enforce. We don't pick and choose the people that we want to favor. Everybody gets treated the same. And when our policies are that way, and when our leadership begins to talk that way, I think it will make a dramatic difference for our nation. Thank you, thank you. We're moving right along here, you're good. Okay. Um, so the next question is a simple one, but a complicated one and an important one. Um, how do you feel about Common Core? Well, I think, as I mentioned before, education is the great divide in our country. It doesn't matter what your ethnic background or any other background, you get a good education, you write your own ticket. Now, the best education is the education that is closest to home. And I've found that, for instance, homeschoolers do the best, private schoolers next best, charter schoolers next best, and public schoolers worse. So that's why we need school choice. Common Core is not school choice. I do believe in standards, but those standards obviously are set by parents and people who do homeschooling or they wouldn't be doing so well. Those standards obviously are set in our private schools and our public schools need to learn how to compete with that, but they don't need some central government tell them how to do it. Okay, this is gonna be the last question. Um, just because your answers are so um, succinct and concise, um, and I'm we a appreciate surgeon. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the last question is, how do you plan to bring your message to the minority community and make them feel more um, included? And also, how do you um, plan on making them um, feel inclusive? I think the key is to tell them the truth. You know, no more of this hiding what's going on. And uh, to see, what I want people to have is real freedom and to, and to have real prosperity. And, you know, I hear some people saying, well, Carson, when he was a kid, you know, you know he benefited from welfare and all this stuff, so, and now he wants to get rid of it. I'm not interested in getting rid of the safety net. I'm really interested in getting rid of dependency. And I want us to find a way to allow people to excel in our society. And as more and more people hear that message, they will recognize who is truly on their side and who is trying to keep them suppressed and cultivate their votes. All right, thank you. Dr. Carson, we really thank you for your remarks this morning, and good luck to you. Thank you. Yes.